Tonight I'd like to take a look at one verse in Psalm 56. It wasn't too long ago that um, we preached through this psalm. But I'd like to concentrate on verse 12 of Psalm 56 as we consider the Lord's Supper tonight. That verse says, Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. Okay, Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. Now the Lord expected men to keep and to honor the commitments that they made under the Mosaic law. But God has not changed. I mean, I hope we realize that. If we make a commitment, God expects us to honor that commitment, especially as Christians. And we consider the promises that God has made to us. He keeps every single one of them. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful too. Uh, still, rather. So for us, we, we need to make sure that we strive after keeping our commitments and honoring the commitments that we make to the Lord. In Numbers 30 and verse 2, it says, If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now, there is a problem, of course, with making a vow, and the Bible mentions this problem when we were going through the Proverbs, and we came to Proverbs 20 and verse 25. The Lord in that proverb warns us about making rash vows. If you make a, a commitment and you're too hasty about making that commitment, it will become a snare to you. It will be something of a trap. And uh, it, it will be something that you kind of wear around your neck as a great weight as you're going through life. It's one thing for you to promise what God requires you to do. It's quite another thing to just kind of hastily make this promise that he does not require. When you commit your way to the Lord, one of the things that you need to learn right off the bat is you have to fulfill your commitments and make sure that you realize that that commitment is made to him in prayer and when you do follow through with that commitment, he is the one that is pleased. Now I understand that commitments are tied often with other people. Um, I've committed myself to this congregation and <laughs> Can you imagine? You call me up and you say, you know, I really need you right now. Could you come over to my house? We're, we're struggling. I say, well, you know, I've got better things to do. Uh, you know, I, I don't do things like that. If somebody calls me, I'm there for them. If, I'm a, if it's physically possible, there's always providential hindrance. But when we make a commitment, we ought to honor the commitment that we make because our God is good about honoring commitments. Well, the Lord's Supper is a memorial, and it's good to have it today because we're, we're going to have another memorial tomorrow that honors human beings, which I think is right. I don't think there's anything unscriptural about that at all. But if we're going to remember the death of human beings who have purchased us a temporal freedom, then we certainly need to remember the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has made us totally free. But we respond to the commitment here that we have by remembering. That's all that this is. And it's very important that we don't lose sight of that. Jesus instituted this ordinance so that we would not forget. So that we would be brought to a place in the life of our church where we'd be forced to remember what he did for us. I say forced, but I think you understand what I'm saying. We need to be Compelled to remember. Compelled, probably a better word. We need to be compelled to remember what Christ has done for us. Now, we believe as a church that there are two ordinances that we need to be faithful about as far as a local church. One of those ordinances is the Lord's Supper. Sometimes it's called communion, sometimes the Lord's table. And the other is called baptism. Baptism is very interesting because it happens just one time. It's not an ordinance that you repeat. In other words, when we were baptized after we were saved, we, we, we showed to everyone that we were going to identify with the body of Christ. But baptism is significant, especially when it's done correctly and biblically, which is by immersion, because when you are baptized or immersed into the water, 
It's a picture of being baptized into Christ's death. That's why I really dislike other modes of baptism. That's why I'm a Baptist. In other words, when a person is converted to Christ, Romans 6 and verse 3 says that, that person is buried with Jesus Christ. What better way to picture that burial than by immersion? <coughs> that just as Christ was raised from the dead and we come up out of the water uh, by the glory of the Father, even so every believer is to walk in the newness of life. So it's a one-time deal because it's supposed to be the start of our commitment to Christ. It's a vow. So when we make this proclamation through this symbol, it is a time where we're saying to the world, I'm beginning this, I'm beginning this journey. I can remember when I was baptized and how eager I was because I caught hold of this. This is the beginning of a new life for me. And it was something that I looked forward to very much. Our, our church at the time didn't have a baptism schedule for quite some time. Pastor Mincy wanted to wait. And I was chomping at the bit to be baptized because I knew that it was important. And I wanted to show everyone that I belong to the body of Christ. Now the Lord's Supper is different because it presents to us two elements that are before us. One of those elements represents the body of Christ and the other the blood of Christ. And we assemble at the Lord's table. We even have a per piece of furniture in our church that is set aside for that purpose. It's the Lord's table. That's what this is. And some churches carved on the front of their uh, communion table, they'll, they'll have the words, in remembrance of me. And that, that's what the Lord's table is all about, to remember the Lord Jesus and what he did for us. So the Lord's Supper is a time of introspection, and it's a time of commitment. Again, another commitment. It's a, it's a time when we recognize the grace of God which energizes our lives daily. It's not that he, he died for us and then we just kind of forget about that. And I think a lot of Christians do. They're not reminded of it as they go throughout their lives. Um, and so they, they fail to recognize that every day I need to die daily and live for Christ. If they would think about what Christ did for them, it would be easier to remember that. But the blood of Christ is important in this uh, picture because I don't know how you think when it comes to the blood of Christ, but there are two aspects to the blood of Christ that you need to remember in, in, in order to really understand what he has done for you. And it took me a while to figure this out, so I always like to explain it. When Christ shed his blood, that... that Shedding of the blood meant the emptying out of his life. And then he gave up his spirit. He died. Really, he died. All right? But that ebbing of Christ's lifeblood also represents a transfer. In other words, it's not just that our sins were wiped away, but there is life in the blood. Okay? And I think that we need to remember that. In other words, the blood, the shedding of blood represents the death of the sacrifice, but in that blood is the life of the animal or the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think about his blood that was shed for us, it was shed for us in order to do away with all of our transgressions, yes. But it was also shed so that we would be made right before God and be energized with his resurrection life. His life is in the blood so that we could openly display that righteousness for his glory. So it's important to remember the two aspects of Christ's blood that was shed for us, both the death and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there is no hope uh, apart from the blood of Christ. I can't say it more forcefully than that. We're talking about blood, and ours is a bloody religion. Christ's blood was shed for us. And so, vows made to you are binding upon me, O God, and I will render praises to you. Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 4. He said, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay for it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Now, some people read that and they say, okay, fine, I won't ever make a vow. 
but I don't think that that's the spirit of the text. God wants us to make vows. God wants us to make promises. And this warning shouldn't deter us from doing that, but it should cause us to take a step back and to think very carefully before we do make a promise before God or to other people. The vow made in Psalm 56 in verse 12 is simple. The psalmist says, I will render praises to you. And that's what we do here each and every Lord's Day. That's the vow that all of us should really make tonight. I will render praises to you in the quietness of this moment that we have together. So perhaps as we're thinking and meditating as things are being distributed tonight, one of the things that should occur to us is my thoughts, are they directed to this worthy theme tonight before the Lord's table? And that is, I will render praises to you. Uh, too often, I think, we let our thoughts just kind of drift into nonsense or to be distracted by the things of this world. And we should be thinking about what Christ has done for us and rendering our praises to him. Now, God does not require what you know of us what he required of, of Israel under the law. We're no longer under the law. We don't make animal sacrifices, at least I hope you don't. All right? And uh, we don't follow any kind of prescribed ceremonial ritual. I don't say the same things every time we have the Lord's Supper. Um, I don't want it to be so informal that we approach the Lord's table in a lackluster way, but I don't want it to be so formal that we approach it in a ritualistic way. It's a kind of a hard balance to strike. But it's something that we ought to strive for. Even those under the law needed to understand that the Lord looked at the heart. He, he didn't look at their actions. It wasn't the ritual. It wasn't the ceremony. It wasn't the sacrifice. But it was the heart behind all of those things. We saw that earlier today. So David vows, I will render praises to you. No wonder he was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't caught up or swept away by all of the ritual. He truly had a heart for God. And this is the vow I think that all of us should make as Christians because God hasn't changed along this score. God wants us to render praises to him. And he wants us to have hearts for him. By the way, do you know what the English word praise means? Do you know why that word is used to translate the, the Hebrew and to translate the Greek word for praise? Well, if you do some study on the word, you're going to come up with a definition that has roughly the equivalent or the idea of to set a price on. Um, almost like an appraisal. The word praise is within an, the word appraisal. So when you get an appraisal, what are you considering? We got an appraisal for our building here. We found out that it was worth about $1.3 million, the property in the physical buildings upon the property. Okay, that's an appraisal. It, we consider the worth of the building. Well, that's what we do when we praise God. We step back. We think. You can't praise God without thinking, which is my uh, problem with much of the subjective elements of worship that we see around us today. But we, when we step back and we think about God and we meditate upon what he has done for us, we are considering his worth, and God is worthy. We're celebrating, we're revering God's character and the work that he did for us. That's an important aspect to praise, to consider the worth of God. But then that has to be quickly followed up with the second element that is mentioned in our text, and that is the idea of thanksgiving. So along with that considering of God's worth is a spirit of thanksgiving, and that will issue forth in verbal thanksgiving. That's why it's important to sing with your mind engaged and to mean the words that you're singing because this is a way in which we praise God. So if we go back to the first ordinance that I mentioned tonight, baptism, <coughs> when you're baptized as a Christian, you're indicating that God is worthy. You are saying he is worthy of this outward expression and in some senses and in some ways you're going to put yourself in danger in some cultures and in some contexts by getting baptized and identifying with Christ. In some ways, even in the culture in which we live today, it's a very humiliating thing. Uh, some people have problem with pride and they're not willing to abase themselves and to be baptized in front of people. 
And yet when we do that and we obey God in this way, we are showing him how thankful we are for him. How thankful that he has put us right with him. Now the Lord's Supper is different because it's not a one-time ordinance, but it's something that occurs over and over again. And so it's not that the sacrifice of Christ occurs over and over again. That's the mistake that the Catholic Church makes. But it's that we remember that one-time sacrifice over and over again because it's necessary. The sacrifice that Christ made for us, but also uh, we don't, we, we don't want to forget what he has done or because once we do forget, you know what happens, no praise, no thanksgiving. That or the praise that we kind of wind up in ourselves is human-centered praise. It's not anything that's based on what Christ has done for me. It's what I think I should be doing as part of the ritual or part of the form. So when we take the elements in hand this evening, we have to determine inside of ourselves, I will render praise to the Lord. I will show him that I am thankful for him, and I will do that in the presence of all that are gathered here tonight because I want to identify with his body. I want to identify with Christ. Now, I would say that when we partake together, then we're paying this vow of thanksgiving. I would say when we by choice, I'm not talking about providential hindrance, but when we by choice skip a night like this and we're not here and we could be here, then we are saying to God, I don't count you as worthy. Now, it doesn't matter what you say or what excuse you give, that's exactly what you're communicating to God. I don't count you as worthy. Now, remember, tried to separate the idea of providential hindrance there. But you'd be surprised at what people would call providential hindrance, right? Are we truly providentially hindered or is it just inconvenient for us to be there? I think that some people, and I've seen this happen over the years, skip the Lord's Supper because of great guilt and grief that they feel over sin that they have not confessed and over relationships that they have not gotten right with other people. And because of that, they feel miserable when they try to partake of the Lord's Supper. So the best thing to do in a case like that, from their perspective, is to avoid it altogether. But to avoid things is not to deal with the problem. We need to make sure that we're saying, I count the Lord as worthy. And I'm ready to humble myself and to make things right with people, even if they don't want to make them right with me. And I'm certainly not going to leave unconfessed sin in my life. I'm going to confess it to the Lord. And don't believe the nonsense that you're hearing today uh, about not confessing your sin as a Christian. That is absolute heresy. And people who teach that don't know the scriptures. It's just that simple. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 was written to believers. James chapter 5, written to believers. Matthew, written to believers. You know, Jesus is speaking to believers. We need to make sure that we get our... Um, we need to make sure that we get our houses in order, that our relationships horizontally are right and that our relationship with God is right. So Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I quote that verse quite, quite a bit. Because it's an important verse, it's a cornerstone verse for us. The sacrifice that is offered in Romans 12 and verse 1 is a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Well, it means that I am going to express myself for Christ, either verbally or in my actions. I am a living sacrifice. It means that I put to death all of my own aspirations and ambitions, and I live for him. If I'm going to render praises to the Lord, I must willingly surrender to him. And that is a continual present tense idea there in that verse, Romans 12 and verse 1. I surrender myself to him daily, and I do so body and soul. I'm a living sacrifice. By the way, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 are not the second door of salvation, as some people erroneously teach. 
you are to present yourself a living sacrifice continually as you go through your life. There are many times when you want to escape from that altar in the picture there. And you have to put yourself back up on the altar and say, Lord, you are worthy. And when we have the Lord's Supper, this is an opportunity for us to do that. Our devotion to service, by the way, and that's the, the idea here in this verse, is really our devotion to God himself. And I think that we sometimes miss that. Sometimes people get caught up in the act of service that they forget the one that they're serving. They're not serving other people. They're not serving a physical building. They're serving God. That's the idea. And so you are committing yourself to accomplishing the will of God for the glory of God. When we sit together and we meditate on these elements and we remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us, we understand that there is no other sacrifice that could possibly be made for sin. That Jesus, according to the scriptures, is the only full and satisfying payment for sin, his blood. He is the propitiation for sin. And so if you don't believe that, then the Bible is pretty clear, you're not a Christian. All right? You can't be a Christian and deny that Jesus is the only satisfying sacrifice for sin. Any sacrifice that we make, namely rendering praises to the Lord, is for the great sacrifice that he made for us. In other words, all the sacrifices that we make as living sacrifices all right, are made in the sphere of Christ. We can't ever forget that. Any sacrifice that I make outside of Christ just sows death. And by the way, will make me bitter and angry. Because a sacrifice that I make, right, if I'm the one making it, then I want people to notice. And when they don't, okay, then I'm going to be offended. Okay, that's death. The sacrifice that I make for Christ is continual and constant throughout every day. And he never forgets. He always remembers because I'm responding to him and his great sacrifice. So it doesn't matter what other people say or what other people think. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? So it is in this way that partaking of the Lord's table would be sanctifying then for us. You know what sanctifying means? We read it in 2 Corinthians 6 um, this, this afternoon. It's to be set apart. To be set apart for God to a greater and greater degree, greater peace, growing in, in my relationship with God, growing in holiness. And so as every day passes, the end of each day ought to take me closer to Christ. That's the way it should be. And if I am living a life that is further and further away from him, then I'm not being conformed to his image. Do you realize that as Christians, we alone are able to say yes to sin and no to sin? Unbelieving people don't have a choice. They're in, dead in their trespasses and sins. They, they must say yes to sin. They're enslaved to it. But that bondage has been broken for us. We can say yes to righteousness for the glory of God. And only a Christian is able to present himself as a daily sacrifice to God, acceptable and holy. No other person can do that. Only a Christian is able to do the will of God. No other person can really do the will of God. And only the Christian is able to render praises to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul wrote, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so we present ourselves as holy before God. We render our praises to him. And we pursue a life of genuine holiness. By the way, there are always going to be people that scoff at that. There are always going to be people that think that, you know, it's ridiculous what you're saying. Um, there are always going to be people that are going to use grace as a as a is an excuse for licentious living um, and there will always be people that are really really legalistic and ritualistic in their forms but that shouldn't stop us from pursuing a genuinely holy life because that's what God wants in all of us 
So, God is not pleased with people who say that they are sold out for Christ, but they are not. But what is equally true is that God is not pleased with those who just kind of grin and bear it throughout their Christian experience. So this verse then comes in to play, and it's very important. Some do all the right things, and then they make their demands before God, and then when those demands are not met, they blame God for it. That's not true holiness. True holiness is not constructing your own righteous life and then demanding from God to give you a, a certain result. That's just another form of self-righteousness. God owes us nothing. We owe God everything. And so we make this vow to him this evening. Render praises to the Lord. Give your lives a sacrifice to God. These are scriptural mandates. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might and do it for the glory of God. Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. Let's pray to you.